Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my laptop today, and so I wasn't able to make a video. Might be time to get a new laptop, we'll have to see. But I wanted to go ahead and, and, and do this one, at least by audio. Um, just something I've been researching and thinking about, and it's not a formed thought, so I'm just kind of including you in my ponderings about this. And, you know, again, I'm no biochemist um, or MD, but I've been doing a lot of thinking about and I've done two videos, as you know, um, and, and if you haven't looked at them and they're anything you're interested in, it's what the hell is happening and then what's happening to us. Um, and I won't go back through all of that I discussed in those two videos, into those videos and audios. Um, but in, in those two, I did a lot of talking about um, kind of our, I, I used the metaphor of our bodies being soup. And in this soup that we are, right, we are, you know, all of our neurotransmitters, and I spoke about GABA and glutamate, serotonin, dopamine, glycine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, those are kind of the major players, certainly our thyroid hormones, uh, progesterone, estrogen, estrogen, testosterone, and then our two kind of um, major stress hormones that we're well aware of in benzo withdrawal are cortisol and adrenaline. I think adrenaline tends to get spoken about a little bit more than cortisol, so I do want to speak about that a little bit. But the one that, that we haven't, I don't see mentioned much anywhere on the boards or just even in articles specific to benzo withdrawal is, is, the, is the hormone um, oxytocin. And, and before I, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about oxytocin and then I want to, and then I'll, I want to circle back to cortisol for a second and then come back to oxytocin. But oxytocin all of a sudden kind of popped up in my mind and I thought, wait a second, this isn't something anyone I can, you know, I, I can't find where it's being discussed. Certainly not to the ex extent that GABA or glutamate or cortisol or adrenaline are being discussed. And if you know much about oxytocin, it's basically what we call kind of the love hormone. It's what creates social bonding and connection. Um, you might be aware of it more as it relates to, for example, um, expectant mothers, um, because um, it, it, it's, it's actually used to um, in obstetrics to help induce labor, as well as contract the uterus back after labor, as well as help um, with lactating. If, if, if moms are having trouble with breastfeeding, oxytocin is, is kind of the hormone that gets the milk flowing. It's also what promotes kind of that, that, that bonding, that early bonding. Um, in fact, there was a study, I think in 2007, where they looked at women in the first trimester of their pregnancies and the women that had higher levels of oxytocin in the first trimester, trimester actually had better bonding with their infant um, post-delivery. Um, that's kind of interesting. And so um, again, I want to come back to, to oxytocin because I think it, it, it might be something for us to think about. Um, as it relates to how it um, plays out in us during benzo withdrawal or doesn't play out in us during benzo withdrawal. But let's go back to a little bit of cortisol and adrenaline for a second. So I, I won't repeat myself and all the things that I talked about um, in those first two videos and audios, um, but please go back and listen because it, this, this, this certainly ties into that and you might need to hear those before you hear this one. Um, because I talk a lot about you know, the GABA receptors all over our body, especially in our limbic system. And our limbic system has in it, you know, again, the, 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 the amygdala sending off the signals to the hypothalamus, which sends off messages to our, um, to our adrenal systems and the HPA axis, and why we kind of stay in this, uh, or can stay in this chronic state of fight or flight. So we, we, we talk a lot about adrenaline and where I hear cortisol being talked about the most on the boards is when people talk about why do I feel so bad when I wake up in the morning and they'll say, well, cortisol's at its highest in the morning or we have high cortisol and that's why we're struggling. And I, I absolutely believe that to be true. But just to kind of go back and think a little bit about adrenaline and cortisol being our stress hormones that are so out of whack in benzo withdrawal or can be. And I kind of think about adrenaline, this is a bad analogy given what we're going through, but I kind of think about adrenaline as like Xanax and cortisol is like the Valium. Adrenaline in, in healthy, normal functioning people um, is more fa fast acting in short term. It's meant to kind of shoot on and get our respiratory organs and our muscles ready for action. Okay, um, and, and, the, the prob and so it, it, it puts us uh, in the right position Okay, to be able to be in that fight or flight and to make those kind of decisions and fast acting decisions about what we're going to do 
uh, related to the fire that's happening or the bear that's coming after us or the car that's chasing us down, okay? The adrenaline is fast acting. It's short term. It kicks in. This isn't a healthy um, non-penso person. Um, in, in folks where the adrenaline kind of people talk about like their adrenals are shot, um, when the, when the adrenal glands are and, and the HPA axis is not working and you're kind of in this heightened state of, of unnecessary adrenal release, right? That's where we get things like chest pains and breathlessness. Um, we can have muscle aches and fatigue and, and certainly mentally when we're in this heightened state with all these adrenaline surges, we're, we're not able to think calm and rationally and use our logical calm minds, wise minds. Cortisol is, again, another stress hormone, and it is higher in the mornings for sure, and that's why I think a lot of us do feel kind of bad in the mornings. But again, it's more of a slower-acting, longer-term stress response, okay? It tar targets different organs than adrenaline, um, and it it's meant to increase glucose, okay? And so it will actually, over the long term, it'll start to kind of pull on non-essential organs to, 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 to keep the glucose... Um, generating, right? Because the, gen the, the glucose is the basically the food or the fuel to, to, for the cells to be able to stay in fight or flight, if that makes sense, okay? So the cortisol is kind of feeding um, the organs that are keeping us and allowing us to keep ourselves out of danger and stay in fight or flight. So when the cort But when the cortisol is high uh, or out of whack, it can affect our reproductive system, our digestive system, um, and our immune system. So again, if cortisol is out of whack, which we know that it most likely is because our stress hormones are out of whack. Why? Because we're both in benzo withdrawal, we're in both acute and also chronic states of stress, uh, in our bodies, um, as they're trying to heal. So this can cause all kinds of things from IBS to acid reflux, churning stomach, um, and certainly our immune systems, you know, can, can be really compromised. People talk about a low sex drive, a low libido. Um, sometimes they even talk about a high libido, but again, kind of like not your typical libido. Certainly a lot of mental fatigue um, that, that happens when there's kind of too much cortisol pumping through. And, and again, our, that, that whole HPA axis, that whole limbic system that's supposed to regulate when and how cortisol and adrenaline are released to keep us safe, that whole system is injured, it's not working, and so everything's out of whack. So what's interesting, let's go back to oxytocin for a second. If oxytocin is our love hormone, it's, it calms us down, it makes us feel good, it, 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 um, we feel uh, safe, we're more trusting, we feel in connection, it's social bonding. Um, adrenaline and cortisol um, actually counteract the release of oxytocin. So you can imagine for those of us going through this, where our adrenaline and our cortisol is out of whack, we're already kind of at a deficit in terms of the release of oxytocin. Then you throw something else into the mix. You throw into the mix that in benzo withdrawal, a lot of us are isolated. Um, we're isolated from our from work. We're isolated from being able to play the way we'd normally play and engage socially. A lot of times we're isolated from our loved ones um, as a result of, of, of being sick. Sometimes they don't believe us. Uh, we have fallouts with people as a result of what we're going through. We feel socially isolated. Um, many of us who do have romantic partners in this don't feel like being touched. Um, we, we, we kind of want to know the person's there, but a lot, I, hear talk, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, I don't want to be touched. We're not cuddling. We're not snuggling. We don't feel well, okay? Uh, I know for me, my whole life, if I don't feel well, the last thing I want is like to be held or cuddled. I, I want to be left alone. I'm like one of those dogs that's dying that goes off to the corner and, you know, I'll come talk to you when I feel better. But now I'm starting to think about oxytocin and I'm like, wow, I think I'm shooting myself in the foot that as I further isolate myself, um, you know, I'm, I'm not allowing for whatever oxytocin could be generated to be there. Throw on top of that, that many of us have gone through benzo withdrawal on top of COVID, which has added another level of isolation, right? So even in benzo withdrawal, when I have seen my family, many times I'm not hugging them. Um, many times I'm not holding and snuggling and cuddling with my little niece and nephews like I normally would. Uh, we've been masked. We've been socially distanced. And so on top of the isolation that's happening in benzo withdrawal, there's been this added piece of, 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 of COVID. 
Um, but eventually, hopefully, COVID will, will not be on our scene to the extent that it's been. But in benzo withdrawal, we, I, you want to think about how adrenaline and cortisol counteract the release of oxytocin, our love and connection hormone, that make us feel good. Um, and, um, and, and then what can we do to increase it? Okay. If you're not, I'm not saying go off and get into a romantic relationship. Um, but certainly for example, um, if you feel up to it, you might want to think about, especially when we get out of COVID, getting a massage, even that can increase the release of oxytocin. Animals, having animals that you love near you, resting your head on them, hearing them breathe, having them lay next to you. This can increase, um, oxytocin. Um, exercise. I know that's hard for a lot of us in this, but ox- uh, consistent exercise releases oxytocin along with dopamine and serotonin. Again, a lot of these hormones and neurotransmitters, none of them exist in a vacuum, right? They're all at play together in that soup that I talk about in those other videos. Um, you know, I was in a, a relationship uh, at one point in my life where I only got to see the person I was in love with every once in a while. And what I, I really kind of came to understand how oxytocin worked, um, and I got curious about it at that point as well. And really, if you th- what would happen is that since I only got to see this person intermittently for short periods of time every once in a while, um, when we got to see each other, we didn't really want to be out of proximity of each other. So, you know, unless one was in the bathroom or something like that, you know, for the, for the days that we might be together, um, we were right there with each other, hugging, snuggling, you know, being in love, eating up every minute that we could. And I would find myself in these highs, you know, like I, I could literally feel the anticipation of seeing this person and would, I'd start to feel better. And then certainly with them, I would move in through the hours and the days into this like rush and this high. And as I began to anticipate them leaving or my leaving, I could begin to feel some of the stress of that creep in, right? And I could feel that oxytocin begin to come down just a little bit. But usually I'd get a day or two after after leaving them or them leaving me where I would you know, still feel the effects of the oxytocin. And then, you know, by a week or so later, um, I was, you know, that oxytocin had depleted. And, and, you know, this is different, right? Than if like, let's say we're in consistent connection with somebody we love and we live with them. Well, we're, you know, we're in some type of a relationship where we see them every day, then we are staying kind of in a consistent level of that oxytocin hit versus these highs and lows, right? And so I began to recognize that you know I was getting these hits, these high hits of oxytocin, and then these drops of oxytocin, and with that would come, you know, potentially the stress of being away from them. So the adrenaline would increase and the cortisol would increase, and then as they began to come back into my life again, here would come the oxytocin. Um, this you know, a totally different topic. We can talk about it at a different time. But I also began to realize that this could create quite an addictive quality in a relationship too, right? Because you're literally getting a hit. It kind of feels like a hit of heroin, right? You know, they talk about chasing the dragon. You know, people are, get that first taste of heroin, and then they're always chasing that same first high. Um, it's not so much like that with oxytocin. It's not quite as dramatic. But I think about. Um, you know, kind of what I was in in that relationship and how that could create an addictive quality because that hit feels so good. And then when it leaves, you know, there's no consistent seeing them that, that keeps it on some level of a balance. This is true for us in benzo withdrawal, right? Well, so first of all, we're not really getting the, the hits of oxytocin that we need. Um, for lots of reasons, the social isolation of it. We don't feel well. Maybe we're disbelieved by our loved ones. We feel rejected. We feel alone. The social, social, social isolation can be really rough in benzo withdrawal, as we all know. Um, but I want to think about how, again, ways that we can can build this in through maybe exercise, our animals. If we have loved ones near us, trying to be with them. Um Interesting, another point to this that I think is, is got me curious about is there was a study done in the Journal of Physiology recently, and it talked about the role of oxytocin um, in, gastro, in our gastro health and our gastrointestinal tract health. And so in one of my last videos, I talked about how 90, over 90% of our serotonin is generated in our gut, right? So when our guts are decimated by antibiotics or med- psych meds or benzodiazepines, 
Um, you know, this is why we can certainly have issues with mood and anxiety as a result of this, our gut taking such a hit where this, the primary generation of the serotonin exists. Um, so it was interesting to see that, that, that this study was talking about oxytocin can actually um, help with digestion and good gut health. So the lack of it can also be a problem. So again, if our adrenaline and our cortisol is getting in the way of our oxytocin release, if our social isolation and our, our sense of aloneness um, and not being in connection with people during this process, then this also affects our gut, which also affects our serotonin, um, which affects our mood, right? So all again, all of this is a soup. And I had a question somebody had asked me a while back, and they were like, you know, I went and had my cortisol tested, and my levels are weren't high. Um, so, you know, why am I feeling so bad if my cortisol levels aren't registering as high? And again, I'm no biochemist, but the way that I think about this is, I think about ourselves in benzo withdrawal as being like a tin can. And if you drop a penny in a tin can, it you know makes a loud sound and it reverberates. If you drop a penny on a bed, it just kind of lands and maybe you hear a little tiny thump, right? But I think about us in benzo withdrawal as being like these tin cans. And so even if our cortisol is not necessarily any higher than our neighbor who's not going through benzo withdrawal, um, the way our sensitized nervous system experiences the ups and downs of adrenaline, of cortisol, um, of the various neurotransmitters, of our sex hormones. Like, for example, uh, it's not uncommon in benzo withdrawal that we feel really bad. Women feel really bad in ovulation or PMS or menstruation. Is it because all of a sudden the, we're dropping and increasing estrogen and progesterone? Uh, higher and lower than we were before benzo withdrawal, not necessarily, but our sensitized systems are feeling the ups and downs, um, like that tin can, right? There's just there's just not enough buffer. We're raw, and so we're feeling everything in a raw state, and so we might not necessarily be having an increase in estrogen. Um, but we're feeling the rise in estrogen differently. We're feeling the highs and lows of cortisol differently. We're feeling the highs and lows of adrenaline differently than we would be um, if we were in a less sensitized state. So anyway, just something to think about. I, again, um, I don't have all the answers. I'll keep doing research, but I wanted to throw oxytocin out there because it's not something I'm seeing discussed a lot. Um, and you know, I was at a conference about 15 years ago for borderline personality disorder. That was kind of a, um, an area that I worked highly in in my clinical work. And, you know, with people that have BPD, they struggle with emotional regulation issues and feeling safe and connected in their relationships. They don't feel effective in their connections and relationships. They have a hard time tolerating frustration. Um, all characteristics and traits that happened to us in benzo withdrawal too, right? And it, this is 15 years ago when they were talking about maybe using nasal sprays of oxytocin to see if they could induce bonding, connection, and safety in folks with BPD. And I'll have to go book, back and look and see. I do know that that, that nasal, um, uh, uh, intranasal um, oxytocin is in use. Um, but what I've looked at so far is it kind of has mixed reviews. So I'm not saying go out and find a doctor to let you snort up some oxytocin. I'm just saying let's think about um, how we're not getting enough of this love hormone um, and how do we maybe build this in while we're trying to heal um, as tin cans in this benzo withdrawal uh, through our animals, through through some degrees of social engagement, um, if we are in a position where we can get a massage or we have a loved one that can cuddle with us and snuggle. Um, again, I'm not talking about sex. If you can do that and feel like you can do that, great. Many of us don't feel like we have much of a libido. And again, that's also a result oftentimes of just being in chronic stress. That cortisol uh, kind of shuts down that function for us. So um, again, we're a big we're a big pot of soup. Um, but one ingredient that I wanted to talk about um, was oxytocin. And I'll keep doing my research and thinking about it and coming on and, and letting you know what I'm finding out. And um, we'll see if it's something that maybe we can work to add in to help ourselves along the way. Thanks so much.